even though the proper community engagement process was followed. Andy Fraser from Otaki College, Kiwa Reoreti from Otaki Medical Centre and the Kura principals were left feeling like they had not been given a heads up on this. I must admit I was one of the breaks in that chain, not really realising that these people had not been informed. I was shocked when I realised that Andy Fraser had not submitted and just assumed that the community would be present as it had been in the previous hearing. Lawyers for liquor outlets are very crafty and they stuck to the letter of the law, leaning on the fact that the objectors' submissions were not robust legally, were based on motive concerns, not legal ones, like the effect of the immediate area, not taking into account the effect on the whole of our community. They won. And Tuanang Old Oak had decided to appeal, even though it was likely to cost lots of money. Luckily for our community, Tuanang Old Oakwood's lawyers did so on pro bono basis. Unfortunately, to no avail, as without medical officer of health and police objecting to our case, it was thrown out. The medical officer of health had actually produced a report about the high level of deprivation and alcohol harm in Ōtaki, but had withdrawn this due to lack of support from the community, but that support was not sought by anyone. The breakdown seems to be in the direct communi communication with those in our community who would have had an interest in this, from all angles, including my own. And that, was why, that is why we would like to see discussion about he how better to engage our community in discussions and processes that will affect them. Now, Hapu Ōtaki is presenting to you on Wednesday and are likely to allude to the number of liquor licences in Ōtaki, the lack of consultation in the community that is in a community that is negatively impacted by our liquor licences. It's not that we don't want liquor outlets, we have enough, we don't, and we all enjoy a wine and a catch-up together. This is about our ten town standing up and saying, we don't need another one, thank you. It adds no value to our town, only lining the pockets of the Auckland-based owner who has no interest in our town. What we need is a local alcohol policy, which would require consultation with the community, especially iwi. But before that, we also need a commitment to some legal assistance from Council so that the community, if there is another application in between now and when we have that policy, can actually create legally robust submissions that will stand up to the District Licensing Board. This is a learning lesson for our community, but could bring about really positive change for us in Ōtaki and the whole district. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Randall. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Shelley, for that presentation. And um, um, how, what do you see the value of having a, the council developing a LAP? And what benefit will it be to the people in Ōtaki? Um, well, it means that there's a, there's a requirement to consult, and so that's what ha it was the breakdown here, is we had no consultation. We, there's a lot of statistics around our town and alcohol harm, deprivation. It should never, this should never have gone ahead. Um, but, and it wasn't a lack of process by council staff, because they did the right thing, but there may be for our community, and especially with something so... Um, that could have such a, an effect on our community, there should be an over and above process. And a local alcohol policy would require that engagement. Councillor McCann. Councillor Shelley, thank you very much. Are you aware that a local alcohol policy could also have a lid and a sinking lid as options for the number of uh, um, off licences? Does that mean to close them down? I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, for the first part of that question, are you aware that uh, a local alcohol policy can have a maximum number of um, off licences? Cool. No other questions, so thank you very much for your time. So that would be in negotiation with the community though, wouldn't it? That maximum level number of alcohol licences.
I'm just noting um, through a question that uh, one of the things you raised can be dealt with through a local alcohol policy, which um, councillors have uh, been talking about and we know are, is on the books and we're hoping that it will occur this year and that is a solution to uh, ensuring that we're meeting the letter of the law. The, some of the issues you raised correctly were not able to be heard because we have to follow the legal process, but there's more than one way um, to follow the legal process and one is an LAP. So also the thing is that in between now and when that alcohol po local alcohol policy is formed, communities like ours are vulnerable to having more people wanting to op open ALF licences. And so in that interim, within this submission, we're asking for council assistance, mainly legal, because Tuanang Oroku's submission did not stand up legally either, because the, the lawyers for the liquor outlets are very, very crafty. And so that's the assistance we need. Right. I'm sure you'll get a response from um, staff at that time. No other questions, so thank you very much. Uh, the next speakers are from the Kapri Equestrian Advisory Group. Is that both of you? Oh, I'm sorry. Switch me on. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, Shelley and I are sharing the spot. I'm here as a representative of KCDC's Cycleway, Walkway and Brideway Advisory Group and Shelley is the Kapiti Equestrian Advocacy Group and we're submitting on much the same things so we are sharing the spot so you don't have to listen to us twice. And in our submissions which you have we have identified a number of separate items that we'd like to see actioned or planned in the next year and they can be grouped under a few headings so we've shared those between us. And the first and the most significant, in my opinion, is the Stride and Ride programme. The Stride and Ride network established to connect the M to PP with the rest of the Paraparaumu and um, Paikokariki areas has been a huge success and we would like to see the same type of network developed when the next part of the expressway is completed. There are a significant number of horses and riders in the Tohoro and Otaki areas who would be frequent users of trails le leading to the expressway and the tracks will be a huge draw card to those both in the wider region and those that we are wanting to attract to come here and stay and ride. Like walkers and cyclists, horse riders like round trips. The opportunity to, for example, ride along the expressway to Pika Pika Road, stop for a coffee at Harrison's, ride down a stride and ride trail to the beach and home again would be a great day out for riders from both the north and the south. There are other opportunities too, such as to Hodo Beach Road, to Walker Road, the Riverbank and back to the Expressway. And we'd encourage Council to look very favourably at committing to such a stride and ride programme. To support these and other trails, we'd also like to see sufficient money in the operations budget for the infrastructure. We've talked for the past two years about new rural signs and feel that now these are needed with some urgency. The old signs seem to have limited effect and as more and more people who have little understanding of how to drive around stock move into the rural areas, new signs with the same message phrased differently are essential. Shelley will talk more about plans to bring visitors to the region, but as part of selling the district, we'd like to be able to point to good, easy parking at the beginning of, tra of tracks and the entrances to the beach. Again, to talk about Pika Pika, it's a very popular start to a beach ride. There's little room to turn and park afloat. There's a great mounting block, but no hitching rail. We'd also like to see hitching rails and, if necessary, mounting blocks at the public toilets. It's a bit of a gamble for a rider to have to ask a member of the public to hold their horse while they use the toilet. Greenaway Road is a very well-used entrance to the Waikanae tr River track and the expressway track but most of it is unusable after rain. It would be impossible today. The grass gets very wet and boggy and it's not suitable for a two-wheel drive vehicle and a four-wheel drive will just rip up the turf. We'd very much like to see this area drained and resurfaced and be able to cope with float parking so that people not, are not forced to park and unload their horses up the street. Here too, there's a great mountain block and a hitching rail to com complement it would be well used. 
And while at the Waikanae River, I'd like to say again that we would like to see that metre-wide strip for horses fully maintained to the head height of a rider. Planting over the last few months is just behind the metre line, but those trees will grow and they will encroach on the metre line as the others already have. The metal used on the track is great for cyclists, not always easy for walkers, and it's awful for barefoot horses. We need the soft grass areas to be kind to our horses and to leave space on the main track for other users. We have been talking to Greater Wellington staff about rationalising access to parks around the whole Wellington region. At present, we need several keys, one from KCDC, and or electronic fobs to get into the parks. We'll be looking for support from KCDC as this project progresses to ensure that, as the only people who are actually required to have keys to access parks, that we have your full support for the rationalisation. Thank you. And I'll now ask Jimmy. Right, well, I'm going to talk about the economic potential of equestrian tourism here on the Kapiti Coast. Because of the cycleway, walkway, bridleway strategy that was developed many years ago and was specifically inclusive of bridleways and connections for horses within the district, we are now poised to take advantage of this for local New Zealand tourism. And in these COVID times where international travel was risky and limited, Kiwis are looking to holiday at home. We have been working with Otaki Māori Racing Club to establish a pilot program for this summer to encourage equestrian visitors to come and stay, um, spend and enjoy our wonderful trails and beaches. We have lots of space. We have Whareroa Farm, Kiwi Park, horse tracks, beaches and beaches that have plenty of room. And now we have businesses catering to us such as the Bus Stop Cafe. Ruth did a survey last year asking equestrians if they would come and camp in Kapiti with their horses. She had responses from as far away as Otago and Auckland. Statistics say there are around 80,000 sport horses in New Zealand. If we have a portion of that number coming to enjoy our district, it would add significantly to the already $13 million economic input of equestrians in the Kapiti economy. We have talked with both Wainui Whenua Group and Paikakariki Community Board about the potential of horse camping in their communities and what would be required to allow this on Wainui Whenua land, which is very little. We will work with them when the time is right. For this to happen, we really need dedicated staff time to coordinate a plan, promote equestrian tourism in Kapiti and implement it. This could be a niche industry as people with horses do want to holiday with them and they bring with them their families who will enjoy other activities. Part of this plan would be the Stride and Ride program for the PP20. We support this proposal in the long term pl plan but would support increased investment in this. If NZTA will equal any money put in, it is vital we get as much infrastructure into this district as we can as they won't be coming back. Growth in Pekka Pekka and Tihoro in Ōtaki is significant um, and Council should be investing in as much as they can for the future. Good off-road connections, especially while NZTA are helping. One of the problems we have with connection at present is the lack of a bridleway on the O2NL. We have campaigned for this since before the O2NL was put back on the table by this government. KCDC staff are very much trying to advocate for this but we would like advocacy to come from elected members also. This connection is important for the district and both Greater Wellington Regional Council and Horizons Re Regional Council, but it is also very important for my hometown of Ōtaki. We want people to come from the north as well as the south. Equestrian business could be set up in this more rural area to the north of Ōtaki as well, and we want these people to be able to come and enjoy our hospitality too. Equestrian businesses could also be set up in Ōtaki and multi-day rides throughout the district stopping at homestays would benefit from a connection to the north. And lastly, the connections to Rikirangi via Devil's Elbow. KCDC owns land at the water plant that could, be, could form part of a safer off-road access. If three metres of land were used and fenced, there would be access for all users on this increasingly busy and dangerous road. There is a large community up in Ricky who might choose to m use more eco-friendly ways to get into town and to the train if there was a safe path. I'm hoping that you have um, submissions from Ricky Rang community about this. For equestrians, it would not only give us safe connections, but also access to trails through to Tihora in the back of Ricky Rangi. 
Um, we have a very positive relationship with our staff here at Cavity Coast District Camp Council. Um, I think I'm out of time. Anyway, I just want you to think about the um, tourism potential. Um, we have just recently launched a national New Zealand Equestrian Advocacy Network and we have a petition going to Parliament in spring which we would invite you to join and sign and we thank the staff, Alison and her team for the work that they do with us and for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Councillor Buckville. <coughs> Thanks Jelly. Did you or your group um, participate in um, the consultation about the destination strategy? We've been doing that for about three years. The last meeting, no, we were not invited, but two of the CWB members were, and they did, I understand, speak on our behalf. But we were not so invited, didn't know it happened until it was over. So the CWB spoke on your behalf? There were two, there were two people there who, who coincidentally are on the CWB. That wasn't why they, they weren't invited as members of the CWB. We didn't know it was on. Okay. We've been Even engaging with of your equestrian group. You didn't know it was on. No. Okay. We've been engaging with um, the economic development strategy here at council for quite a few years, and just seemed to go around a bit in circles. But trying to have a plan going forward for economic development and tourism. Councillor Coates. Morning, Shelley and Ruth. Hi. Um, Thanks for speaking today. It, it's along a similar line as Councillor Buswell and um, speaking specifically to the economic development strategy that was developed and is now, um, we now have the Kotahitanga board um, that oversees the implementation of that. So have you approached them to sort of see where um, equestrians fit into that economic development strategy and the priority years and so forth? Um, I've certainly read the report that was done some time ago um, and understand the benefits to the district. I'm just wondering whether you've had that discussion with the Kotahitanga board. Yeah, I haven't read it. I don't know that existed. I have talked to the staff with Shelley and by myself for probably, I don't know, over the well, I've been involved seven years, and I don't know how many meetings I've had, and I haven't seen any tangible result. Um, so can I just clarify, when you said you haven't seen it, are you referring to the economic development strategy with the pillars and the outputs and so forth? If not, I'll see offline that you get a copy of that. Yeah, that's what I'm... Yeah, I haven't seen it in anything. Okay. So, yes, I'd okay. be grateful. I'll, I'll Thank you. I'll sure to see that that gets out to you. The second question I've got is, um, regionally, I, I know both of you ladies are well connected through the equestrian circles. How, how does um, Kapiti sit regionally in terms of equestrian access and... Um, tracks and so forth. Are we lagging behind? Are we a leader within the country in terms of the access and the consideration that's given to the equestrian communities? I would say we're a bit envied um, in a lot of places. Like Horifanua District Council has absolutely no policy on ho including horses and tracks. They've now got a Horifanua Equestrian Advocacy Group also and I spoke at their submissions last week along with their representative. Um, so yes, I think we've been very lucky with our staff and we've also been very lucky that we have a CWB strategy that informs um, inclusion of bridleways and has done for a long time, I think from the time of Jenny Rowan it was created 20 years ago or maybe before her. Um, yeah, so we are lucky that we have been included because one of the things we have realised now that we're connecting district to district, because we've now got a big umbrella, a lot of groups happening, is that we don't have, central gov government does not legislate for equestrians inclusion, and it doesn't fund it. So it's on the council's head kind of thing, out of their capital budgets to include us. Um, and that's why we're taking a petition to parliament, because actually, as a user recreational group, we are not recognised and we're not funded. So. There is a problem, but we have a we've got a great team of staff here. Lucky oh, for us. Last question in terms of Otaki to North of Levan. I know that you've been active in terms of talking with the uh, council up there. Have they indicated that they're not considering bridal access to any proposed shared pathway? Understanding that there hasn't been a an announcement around O2E now or a re announcement. 
what's the council's position on? Most recently, we've heard that they are now asking if they can have a bridal way too. Okay. And so I submitted on that to Horofanua and to Horizons to include a bridal way because we also have the saddle road, which um, initially was supposed to have a bridal way across from Woodville to Ashurst. And now they're only going to go halfway with that. So th these issues are everywhere, um, and mostly it's funding and legislation. Thanks, ladies. Councillor Bravanov. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, thank you, um, Shalene, with coming along, giving a very detailed, um, speaking to you very detailed submissions. I just want to clarify something. I'm sh pretty certain, Ruth, um, when you introduced yourself, you said that you were. I know that you two are on the CWB. And I'm pretty certain that you introduced yourself as speaking on behalf of the CWB. Could you just clarify that, please? In this instance, I'm not the speaker on behalf of. Um, Bruce has put in a submission, which includes equestrian things, but I just introduced myself as being that rep. So this is... The equestrian oh, rep. Oh, the equestrian rep. I'm not sure how this fits in here, but um, okay. we're, we're both... Also, um, the uh, on the Kapiti Equestrian Advocacy Group. Okay, so I suppose then, um, so CWB plays a big plays a big part in some of this. So I'm just wondering. So I'm also on that, as you well know. Um, so I'm just wondering um, whether you feel that there needs to be more support from council um, in relation to some of the um, the horse bridal ways than than what is coming from the CWB. Yes, I think that's absolutely correct. I don't think a lot of support comes from that group always. And um, I would like to see more. Thank you. Can I just say something to that too, Jocelyn? I think it's good if you could see the potential. That's the thing. There is potential here. We do have a lot of places we can ride. We we're not in the middle of town or anything. We've, that's been set up. There's a, there's a huge potential here to be a niche. You know, we could be that niche industry. There's a whole lot of horses in Wellington, heaps of them, that if they could come out every weekend and camp and ride, they would, and they bring their money. So. Uh, through you, Mr Chair, and I think you just answered my um, question just then, um, Shelley. But one thing I did want to comment on, uh, you said that the situation where you find ourselves in the equestrian market was you're quite lucky. Um, I just want to push back against that, and I think, don't think it's had a heck of a lot to do with it. I think it's the hard work of people like yourselves that have brought this up. Um, I, one question I did have was, is there, with regards to the equestrian body, do you guys have a voice? Do you have a collective as such uh, that's connected to all our local equestrian aspects, if you like? Like Either. Well, I would say our Capity Equestrian Advocacy Group is now our local um, body, but we've since probably two months ago we created the New Zealand Equestrian Advocacy ne Network because from our Capity Equestrian Advocacy Group we've now sprung up. There's Horofanua, there's Manawatu, there's West Coast, there's Auckland, there's Wellington. We've got this little thing going now we've got an umbrella over top of them just to because everyone's experiencing this and I think where I say lucky we're lucky we're lucky we have staff who are very engaging and we've got a strategy that includes us so there's more to do but we have yeah don't we're not letting those staff go anywhere <laughs> and would it be a fair comment that we're sort of by your words we're ahead of the game so if we do sort of like focus on say equestrian tourism there's a very good chance we'll get a good response back on that Absolutely. Thank you. We, we, are, we are envied, as I think as Shelley said earlier, but we don't want to lose that spot. We have to keep developing what we have, making it bigger, making it better, making, it, making us the place to come. Thank you very much, um, Shelley and Ruth. Thank you for putting in the submission and coming up to speak on it. Thank you. The next submitter is... Um, Principal Tony Keane, Carberry College. Yeah. I just went straight back off again. Okay. Um, 
Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to have a have a bit of a chat about uh, Te Reukura this morning. And and um, look, in part, it's a it's submission to the long term plan, but it's also um, a bit of an opportunity to catch the council up on where we are, and uh, and and maybe for you to ask a few questions. Um, the last time I came and, and talked to council about Te Reukura was was now about four years ago, and that was that was the stage at which it was, or maybe five. Um, Agreed that the, that council would invest um, with a grant of 1.6 million into the facility, and the reasoning for that was that that would guarantee community access, which is fine. Um, and things got a little bit more complicated than that. And the reason that they got more complicated is that we'd we'd thought in really quite small terms when we began, and the terms that we'd thought in was we're building a building for for the school, which we. We're part of the community in which we want the community to use. And about halfway through 2019, the the slightly rude shock that we that we got was was from um, performing artists and and also from from uh, venues managers in Wellington who came out and said, you don't you don't really understand what you've built here. See, what you think you've built is a is a little facility in in, in Carpety that some that some people might come to, but you haven't. You've, you've built a regional facility and, and people will want to come to it. And, and, and that's exactly what's happened. So we've had, the, as you know, we've had the ballet and the, and the symphony and, and, and all, sorts of, all sorts of groups through. I mean, there's, I don't know, I'm not that sure that there's a weekend left in the year that there isn't something either penciled in or, or scheduled to go. Over the next month, if you want to get in for an event on a Saturday, you're just, you're just out of luck. So some of those are communities. So for example, uh, on Saturday, the Kapiti Concert Orchestra held a performance there, and um, for which we we had to do a fair bit of work in advance, which I'll t talk to in a minute. Uh, and on on Friday, there were 500 students from all around the region in the uh, at Ngamano Kōrero um, speech competitions, which was which was fabulous. So we get we get great feedback from that, and and that the the uh, Ngamano um, participants. The, st the teachers were all saying this is the best venue we've been to in terms of, of sound. You've got, you've got the sound right in it, there's more than one space, and, and so on and so on. So, so when, we were, when we were setting out on, on this road about, so as a community venue, what does it need? We did a lot of talking to community um, groups, and, and, and they, of course, all had their own vision of exactly how it would be. Um, not one of which we could entirely meet, but, but our commitment was we'll build a venue which will meet at least most of, of what you all um, need. The bit that we didn't entirely realise is the, is the commitment that it would take in terms of turning a school venue into a professional venue. That's, that's the piece that we really did not understand. So when those people came out from Wellington, they said, unless you have a a professional venue manager unless you have uh, professional permanent technician support your venue is not going to work and they were and they were exactly right <laughs> sadly sadly that means that means quite a few more dollars now the, the and we make it we make the venue available at community rates to community groups which is which is only right that's our deal with that's our deal with council and anyway our obligation to our community we do exactly the same thing with the sport and rec center is that my thing to stop talking? Oh yeah, keep going. Okay. Um, so the so the, the 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 upshot of it really is 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 that what we've discovered is that the easiest people to deal with are the touring groups. Um, they they have an understanding and an expectation of what it takes to come into a venue. In one day, set up, perform, and disappear. Uh, the community groups they need they're great and it's fantastic having them in there but they, but it it takes a much longer commitment it takes an awful lot more work it takes a really disproportionate amount of of our time so what the discovery for us really in this last year has been that that we needed to and we still need to dedicate more time to to ensuring that the community groups get best use of the facility, and that actually means putting the manpower into into taking them through all of those processes. 
So the process of that will, over time, will be upskilling community groups and, and how to use a venue such as ours. It's utterly different to going along and performing in um, Waikanae Memorial Hall or, or in, or in um, St Paul's or any of those sort of venues. So professional venues, a lot of dangerous stuff around, there's a lot of health and safety issues and so on. So, so my submission is, is I'm, there's a small line in the, in, in the, in the fine print somewhere and, um, and I guess I'm asking council to keep that in. Um, we, we really do need the, the support, the financial support to provide more support to those community groups. Questions? Councillor Buzzell. Thanks, Tony, for coming in. Um, in terms of the community participation, could you um, just off the cuff let us know how much use is um, used by Otaki College and Parafumu College coming down to work? I mean, you, you mentioned the um, Namanu Kōrero yes, that happened, yeah. but that's a Wellington regional thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good question. The other, the other colleges haven't requested use yet except insofar as things where we are joined together anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so um, for example, ourselves in Paraparamu College um, at the moment run a joint kapahaka in, in terms of competing in the, in the regional competitions. So there are, there are, those, there are those opportunities. Mm -hmm. There still is that issue, isn't there, of Otaki up there and 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 down here, it's it's weird. It's 15 minutes drive, but there still is that issue in the in the district. Yeah. Also, just another question. Um, I remember early on in the piece you have, um, and I'm just going to term it as a contract with a church to operate out of there on a Sunday. Yeah. How long is that contract for? The contract is for 10 years, so we're in our second oh. year of it. Okay. Yeah, and I know. I, look, I know that that's I know that that's a, a big stumbling block for a lot of community groups who are used to. But the church pays our bills. Yeah. They, they, they pay, they pay a $35,000 insurance bill. Okay. You know, it, it actually does cost pretty big money to to um, to have that venue on our on our site. And I guess that's nice to understand that figure around the commitment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the other thing I guess I would I would say is that I think quite a few community groups went in early days went. This is impossible. We can't possibly use it because everything is on a Sunday and, and people won't come along on a Saturday. I think Carpety Concert Orchestra have found that actually people will come along on a Saturday. It's 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 fine. Yes, it's preferable for the Sunday, but you know the grandparents will miss the kids' game and come along to Carpety to the concert orchestra. It will be all right. Councillor Cook. Good morning, Tony, and congratulations on the success of the facility. Thank you. Um, I did want to touch on um, a little bit of what Councillor Buswell has said, being the Otaki Ward Councillor, mm. and um, without putting you too much on the spot, just um, understanding the the LTP discussion around the indoor sports um, stadium and um, potentially in Parapara Umu. So the question that Councillor Buswell posed around the use or lack of from mm. people in Otaki, is that through... Um, a lack at their end in terms of requesting access to it, or is it a lack of availability for it to be available to be used? I'm just trying to understand. It's not. It's certainly not a lack of availability, and and we'd love to see the see more Otaki productions down our way. Um, I get, however, because you know you 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 are your little piece as well, and I get if you were. Um, in Otaki, would you would you want to keep on using your own the own small your own small theatre up there? Yeah, I probably would. It would it would take a little bit to to move out of there. Um, it took a little bit, I think, for coasters to decide that they would put on a performance in Tadokura rather than in in their own venue, as well. There's that there's that holding to that. So no, no, it's not. It's, it certainly isn't isn't lack of access, and we'd love to have more um, Otaki groups down there. If you think about coasters, uh, the coasters' performance because they're they're doing one um, later in the year. I'm not sure that they've announced what yet, so I won't so I won't say that. But but you know that's 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 performing artists from right throughout the region, and there are substantial numbers of of Otaki people who are involved in coasters' productions, and vice versa. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Harbro. Yeah, thanks for coming along, Tony. It's great to get an update. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, audience numbers coming through. Mm. It, um, how are the shows doing as they come through district? Um, you come thinking particularly of the local ones? Yes, um, the, the, well, the local ones are doing really well, um, and a lot of that, a lot of that is that you have your existing databases, and 
uh, um, a slight frustration for us, as, as, as you'll understand, is that we want their databases. That is, we want a, we want a much wider, a carpety wide and, and beyond that database so that when, when things are coming up, we can shoot the information out to anybody who's interested in the arts and, the, and coming along in the, in the area as a whole. One of the things that the Wellington people um, did say to us um, a couple of years ago was, you're thinking about the performing artists and you have to think about your audiences and you have to put on a range of things and you have to time stuff so that, you know, three comedians, three Saturdays in a, way, in a row is just not going to work for you because they're going to cannibalise each other in terms of audiences. So, so we've spent a bit of time working out how we, how we make all of that work as well. Cool. Did I, I go a question. long way away from your question? I don't know. Yeah, no, no, that, 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 that's good. I've got a second question, and that's about the... Um, the cost of hiring the facility. Mm. Have you, because it's um, not the Waikanae Memorial Hall, but it also costs more. Um, yeah, have does. you had any feedback about that, and is that working out for people? I think it's working out fine. And what we often have with community groups is a sharp intake of breath when they realise it's not it's not two hundred dollars to hire the um, the community hall. But but you know you have to have people there. You just have to have technical support there. You have to have the, your venue manager or, or deputised one has to be there and, and, and so on and so on. You can, and you can't just have people walk in and use the place. You've got tons of lethal equipment sitting in roofs if, if they get it wrong. Um, so uh, I, I think where people go to, come to pretty quickly is, is when you say, look, the costs of using this are about $3 a seat. We will help you ensure that you have a full audience there, mm -hmm. and and that way that's going to make it that's going to make it pretty viable for you. The cost of tickets, just to give you some idea about what's happened with that, um, I think groups who might have been doing the gold coin donation and or the five dollar entry are, are tending not to do that anymore. We we suggest to them that probably you you need to have a price. If you don't, if you don't value your own performance, how are you going to set your price point? So we 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 suggest to them that that for the venue, probably for a community thing, you're probably going to go somewhere between twenty and thirty dollars. For a for a bigger event, you're probably going to go somewhere between thirty and forty dollars. To give you an illustration of where you can go, um, the shows must go on. Group that toured around the country um, last year, they charged ninety dollars and sold out the venue. Mm. Which astonished me because I didn't think you'd sell out. I thought you'd sell out in Wellington, you know, because it's the Opera House or whatever. But I didn't think you'd sell out up here. It does suggest that that people are prepared to pay for the quality. Yeah, I think that background support is quite crucial and key. And I don't want to ramble, but I do want to say that the, when I was involved in a company concert orchestra performance last year, they said there must be something wrong with the booking system because we can't book tickets. And I said, that's called being sold out, guys. <laughs> That was rambling, but uh, next question, Councillor Holiday. Thank you, through you, Mr Chair. And um, Tony, I just want to congratulate you on the uh, venue. I did 17 years at Circuit Theatre, and I remember walking through that venue when it first opened and here having a very good understanding of the asset that you've got there. Um, a question I have, um, were you guys involved in the destination planning um, work that's just been done at all? No. Um, do you guys... Um, can, can, can I say that, that one of the things that we've really struggled to do, and the reason that I'm here, is that is that we've struggled simply to get enough time, management time, to to look very much beyond. It's a it's an it's an issue for us. And I guess that's just what I'm fishing for, just getting a bit of information about that. Do you guys do any grant applications to Creative New Zealand with regards to what you do down there as well? Is that we have. <coughs> we're in the we're in the awkward position. We've run a few shows ourselves, um, and and just for uh, after post COVID, for example. We put an application in, and then we're now we're just we're just going to grab some local comedians and get something back in, and get this get the theatre back running again, and just say to people in the in the community, the arts are going again. It's COVID's okay, it's not over, but locally it's over. Uh, we have a lot of difficulty with that as a school. Schools can apply for some things that that community groups sometimes can't, but there's an awful lot of things that that groups will go on oh, no, a year school. So we've struck that time again. Okay. Um, just curious, too, are you linked in with the business, local business association, with BEAD down there as well, just with regards to offering 
packages of or things for people that want to dine or that sort of we've, stuff? We've had, um, yes, Sonia's been around the, the, the local businesses and, and, and had quite a few discussions with them. Cool. Yeah. And um, look, I hear what you're saying with regards to um, filling up the, um, the venues and that sort of thing. Now, I think with Transmission Gully opening up, you're actually going to be more of a preferred venue to come to in the Wellington region than most of the, I dare say, a lot of venues in Wellington, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. You can park, for starters. Mm. Yep. It's <laughs> good free. You can park free. Yeah, yeah. and you don't get charged for it. There's good restaurants nearby. You know. Thank you. Quick question from Councillor Elliot. Oh, is it? Um, thank you, Tony. It's great to hear um, that it's doing as, as well as we hear. That's incredible. Um, I'm wondering, you spoke about the need to upskill local groups. So I just want to get that down to some practicality. Mm. Are you looking at something like running some short courses for sound technician, lighting technician? Yes, that's that, that, how that, it would work? that is that is the sort of stuff that we need to do. We need we need yeah. to, what we need to do over time is build is build confidence in that those yeah. local groups that they can come in and and our our confidence in them also yes. that the skill set is there. Thank you. That's wonderful. If, if I can give you just a little example of that, you know, we talked about Arise being in there on Sundays. It took a long time before we were comfortable that the Arise people understood the venue and, and, mm. and also what it could do, and they had some very good technical people with them. So this just takes time. Right, and last question, Councillor Hampton. Kia ora, TK. Um, so, how are you? <laughs> quick question around the feedback you've had from students of Kapiti College and parents in terms of using it as a learning facility and the various classrooms and things. I'm just keen to understand um, feedback you've had from students. Yeah, the, well, the kids, I mean, the kids love it, as, as, as you'd expect. Um, if, you, if you go in there at, at intervals and lunch times, it's, it's packed. They just want to be there and want to, and want to be around it. There are, there are courses that are running from the Performing Arts Technology and um, Hodel Maori is part of it, and there's, there's just all this, all this stuff that's now, that's now running because it's there. But I fully expect that in about five years' time, that the kids will look at me and go, "Oh well, every school's got one of these, haven't they?" Right. Um, thank you very much for your submission and fronting up to talk to it. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, the next submitter is James Westbury, Waikanae Community Board. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity to talk on behalf of the Waikanae community. Firstly, I wanted to say thank you very much for uh, the pre-consultation and exposure draft to the long-term plan. It's really great as a community board to be able to participate in those processes in particular and seeing some of the um, areas of investment that we were seeking as a community board uh, reflected in the draft plan. Um, really what I'm interested in uh, discussing today, I'm, I'm really supportive of the long-term plan, particularly with regards to uh, the investment that's going to be made in Waikanae Library from uh, 13.8 million and also uh, Waikanae Park, the Waikanae Beach Hall and also the commitment we had from uh, Sean that we would see some investment in the Elizabeth Street crossing used within current budgets. Um, we're also supportive of the Waikanae uh, Community Board um, uh, communications and engagement initiative that the Council have put forward there. Um, so in general, that's something we're absolutely um, uh, heartened to see, that the Council and the staff have really worked with the Community Board uh, to secure these investments. Um, there's one or two issues that have really come up since we've been discussing um, those exposure drafts with you that we'd probably like to explore in a little bit more detail and just to make you aware that the, the community would like to see maybe some consideration for that. I know you can't solve all the problems and we do live in a resource um, that is finite. So um, some of the things that have been brought to our attention during our discussions uh, with the community is about the closure of the Waikanae uh, Recycling and Green Waste Centre. Um, the community board, in terms of the, the general consensus from our community, is that they're not really looking forward to see the closure of that facility. Whilst I recognise that there's an approximate cost pressure around 140000 that that creates for council, um, the previous councillor of Waikanae um, has indicated that there was a commitment with the closure of the landfill that there would be a, um, a green waste and recycling centre remaining in Waikanae and would, we would really like to appeal to the council to reconsider 
um, the impact of that closure, uh, considering that the council's got a, a massive attempt at managing climate change and um, the recent discussions. I know Jack that he's been leading is about um, waste management and disposal. So you know, a facility such as this really does encourage recycling and the reuse and repurposing of green waste. So it's just something to keep at the back of your mind while you might be closing a site like that, um, particularly in a demographic that um, is not actively mobile and driving much further than the uh, current uh, alternative might propose some challenges. So I'd hate to see the reduction in recycling as a consequence of the closure of that site. Whilst I recognise that we do live in a, a resource finite environment, it's just a consideration that we'd certainly like you to see. Um, I know that the council did give a commitment there. Um, in addition, uh, the Waikano Beach residents uh, Association has indicated that they've got a number of concerns about the level of investment and the, the timelines out for investment in with regards to stormwater and reticulation of wastewater out in that community, given the population growth that is anticipated in those areas. And whilst it won't be fixed in this long-term plan, we recognise that it would be an opportunity to start engaging with the community at uh, some point in time where we can have some greater clarity around the lever of investment and it, should it be sufficient. In terms of the other initiatives um, uh, with regards to climate change, any investment that the council makes in any um, council or climate change initiatives just needs to be evidence-based. We're not seeking to um, obstruct or um, uh, dissuade the initiatives of climate change, but we want any initiative that is undertaken to be evidence-based and to ensure that you know we're not we are reacting in a measure in a fashion that can provide clear benefits and a sustainable level of investment for our community. Uh, with regards to strengthening um, the recovery and including resilience, um, we believe the Council's been doing a good job in that aspect and would like to see that continue. The key thing we do ask is that you continue to encourage and the community board's participation in some of those discussions. The, the last one, which is probably the most overwhelming, is the changes impacting Council with regards to uh, the Resource Management Act reforms and also um, the three waters. We just ask that community boards are involved in that transition and that pathway and you use us as a grassroots sounder for how some of those reforms will impact our community but also our local ratepayers. So thank you very much for give, having the opportunity to speak today. Um, we are very supportive and very grateful for seeing the investment that we're seeing in Waikanae. Um, we'd just like some consideration, particularly with regards to the Green Waste Initiative closure, you know, and where that sits. Um, I know in, a, in achieving a balanced budget is difficult, but it's something, given the climate change initiatives that are on board, if some thought can be given to that. Councillor McCann. Sure, I thought I'd channel Sophie for a second, and I just wonder whether um, there were any evidence-based initiatives that the, the Council is taking regarding climate change that you don't see as evidence-based. Well, we have seen that, you know, um, you, like say, for example, Wayne indicated, you know, at some stage was you could rep do your fleet replacement for example, faster and quicker at this point in time, is it a sustainable and um, efficient way of um, managing climate change? What other initiatives might the Council have available to it? It's not saying not to, it's just saying that any investments that are made are, are sustainable and readily achievable and, you know, at what rate do we do it at the right speed? So what, what I'm hearing there is that is evidence-based, what you're concerned about is the speed at which perhaps we change our council fleet over to electrics. Um, not necessarily, that's probably a bad example, but it's just making sure that your um, plan transition is affordable and it's timely. So, you know, and that's reflecting some of the discussions that Wayne described, you know, at what pace, you can go at any pace you like with regards to a Addressing climate change, but make sure it's affordable and it's it's actually going to be achievable. Councillor Coates. 
G'day James, um, thanks for coming in and speaking to um, your submission. We've obviously received a, a range of views around the um, recycling centre and why can I say more of those towards, um, or certainly a lot of them towards keeping it open. You've already mentioned the cost implications of doing so. If it was um, at the end of it the will of the council that we did consider closing it, would uh, as a fallback position your view be that uh, why can I could retain it open at a targeted rate? If it was that important to why can I use this? It's not something that we've actively can um, this the community on with regards to a targeted rate, so I wouldn't like to say that that would be a general consensus in our community. It would certainly be something we could work with the council to explore um, as an alternative. Um, I'd just ask that where decisions like that are made that each region or area, say for example Otaki, if you've got a, a similar type thing that the similar vein is taken, if you're closing our one, are you closing other sites across the country and, or the, our area and you're treating us the same? Sure. I'm for holiday. <clears throat> Through you Mr Chair. Um, hi James, look I just wanted to um, ask around the housing uh, question that you answered here which was um, you thought um, council really should be looking at getting its systems sorted out, or you know, yep. having having good systems in regards to that space, and not from a financial perspective. What are your views around an advocacy role uh, from a council perspective? Most certainly, I think that is one of the tools that council can use to improve um, access to housing, particularly affordable housing, using the tools that we've got. Hopefully, some of the changes that come out of the Resource Management Act are certainly going to facilitate. Um, you know, faster building, a uh, greater degree of which council can influence consenting. So I'm hoping that we see some of those levers opened up for council to enable affordable housing to expand. I'm, the difficulty, like anybody, is at what speed that can be achieved at um, and how long it will take to implement. Thank you. Councillor Hampton. Thanks, James. Just in terms of your concern around council not not acting based on a solid base of evidence in terms of our response to the climate crisis, um, just like to kind of get your thoughts on whether um, the draft strategic framework principles included also in the long term plan consultation document that say um, this includes a commitment to act in the face of uncertainty using the best scientific information available, whether that encompasses your That's concern. Basically, I've taken that from the document. I just want to make sure yep. that any investment that's made is made, you know, not in a knee-jerk fashion, but actually it's scientifically based and evidence-based. And, you know, I've got no problem supporting well-researched, well-evidence-based investment in terms of climate change. Thank you. Councillor Bravanov. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, James, for coming along today to um, speak on behalf of the Community Board. So I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one um, relates to um, the Board's comments around managing growth, saying that growth should not be for growth's sake. So um, I'm just wondering what the Board's view is on um, the conversations that have been occurring in terms of growth and, and the discussions that have been had around what potentially could be happening in the Waikanae area? Growth's a really difficult one to manage from a community board. We're an advocate for the community. What I'm, as a board, we're not seeking to see is sporadic and unplanned um, growth in our community. We'd like to see the district plan and the say the um, that's put in place to enable effective planning tools for both developers and the, the council has the right frameworks in place to ensure development is in the right place, that the infrastructure to support that development is in the right place. Um, the district plan ultimately will be the document that directs how developers behave and also the community board as is council responsible for ensuring that district plan um, is consistent with the legislation but also consistent with the, the wishes of what the community are seeking. So we're not seeking growth for growth's sake, we want to make sure it's controlled, it's planned and coordinated and we're not seeing ad hoc growth just popping up. So the district plan, uh, that's where this really highlights the importance of that. So do you think that the discussions that have been um, going on are in the right direction? With regards to the district plan, it's really difficult to say... Just before the district plan? No, I know, but we've got an operative district plan in place at this point in time which governs how the 
developments um, are in plan and in process. So in terms of does that need to be reviewed again, um, in terms of how the council's documents are, um, there might need to be some support from council and staff and community, not just in Waikanae but all uh, regions around the Kapiti Coast about how the district plan is augmenting growth and also just picking up on the comments before, you know, is the necessary infrastructure going to be in place and how can the council open up affordable housing for our community with the tools and levers it's got and that shall be coming uh, to, you know, ensure that that growth is in the right areas. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is around the uh, recycling and green waste um, facility in Waikanae. So, um, so I just want to separate out the, the, the recycling and the green waste. Is, is one more important to the other or do they both go together? So that's one part of it. The other part is too, I know you talked about the commitment that had been made previously by KTDC. Was there any time um, frame put around that? In terms of the documents I've been able to research following a conversation with Michael, there's not a time frame in there. So there was a commit from, from Council um, that the Green Waste Centre and the Recycling Centre would, would remain open given the basis of um, the closure of the landfill. Um, there is no time period mentioned in any of the documents that I could find because that was one of the first things I went to after a discussion with Michael. Um, we haven't actively consulted on whether the community would want either or. Um, the general consensus from members of the public that have been in discussion with have indicated that they would like both the ability to, for green waste and um, recycling. Um, okay, thank you. So just um, a couple more questions. So as a community board, I think you're the first community board to speak, um, and I suppose you're an advocate for other um, for, for the community, but there's also some quite large um, community groups who have put in submissions, and one is Ricky Orangi, and the other one is the Waikanae Beat um, Resident Society, and I'm just wondering whether you support their um, applications. We've, I've spoken with the Waikanae Beach Residents Association, and we support their um, concerns that they've raised, particularly um, around um, uh, the investment in the Waikanae Beach Hall. Um, also their noting of the um, stormwater infrastructure. The, I understand that they're also supporting the Waikanae Library and the Waikanae Park as investments. The Riki Orangi, um, I haven't actively involved, been involved with their submission. Because I know with the Waikanae Beach, uh, the Waikanae Beach Resident Society is, so there's $250,000, there's the, 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 a lump amount of money, and then there's a lot of money that's been, um, that, that's been allocated on a much smaller basis over the Councillor Ravana, can you make your question very yes. precise and the answer very precise? Okay. I've got another submitter waiting. S so they are saying that they're actually advocating for a new a new hall. Um, is that what the community board is supporting as well? In terms of recognising that the council's got to balance its budget at this point, yes, we would love to have a new hall or something that might um, be fashioned in that, recognising the budget constraints we're under. You know, this is a big step forward from where we've seen in the previous long-term plan and annual plans. Um, hopefully, once this money's secured in the long-term plan, that we can start another engagement process with the council about what that might look like in future. Um, and also with the Waikanae Library, what could pan or be part of the larger development from that is could a hall be uh, part of that type of investment. So let's look at mo mixed multi-use facilities in our community rather than building a lot more of them. Let's get facilities that have a greater utility, a higher public. Thank you very much, Mr. Vesperi, you. for your submission and fronting up to speak to it. Our next submitter is Thank Adrian you. Gregory. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to talk to my submission. Um, I'm going to start off by just adding a sort of general postscript, if you like, to my comments on, on housing. Um, and I'll keep, it, I'll keep this bit short. Um, you've read my submission. You get, I think, the sense of what uh, my approach is. Highly supportive of the Council having and taking uh, an active role in housing. My postscript is quite simple. It is that whatever is done must be done in combination with the community, and not just the community board, but the wider community, because the housing we're looking for in the future 
is housing that reflects that particular community and we can talk about the district but actually we should talk about various parts of the district, the various townships, reflect those communities, replenish them and enhance them. Um, and, and James himself has just referred to ad hoc and sporadic development which is certainly not what I would want to see. I would want to see something that actually does replenish, reflect and enhance our communities. And that would include social housing. But I want to concentrate my uh, comments on the submission I made on Otaki Community Facilities, which is very specific. And some of you will remember I, I referred to it in my submission, uh, the submission I made in 2018, um, which received a response uh, from the Mayor in which uh, he said the council agreed to support investigation into the merits of a community hub and possible locations, but no additional funding was made available through this long-term plan. And then um, Tanya Parata will be in contact with you and so on. Now, that has actually happened. Uh, I'll give you a very brief update because it does put things into context, uh, but it also puts things into scale. The context is... Um, that it is very likely that the existing Birthright Family Centre will uh, close very shortly. Um, it is in extremely poor condition. Uh, it's a council asset, and the council will determine what it's going to um, use that asset for, be it the building itself or, or, or the plot, the section. Uh, in doing that, we are looking at co-locating with another organisation um, in the town, uh, and it will be a very effective co-location. But it's, it's, this is where the issue of scale comes in. This is a tiny move to a tiny location, and what I have made a submission on the basis of is a much larger, purpose-built, multi-use uh, facility, which I'm referring to as a community hub. It would serve the wider community. It would draw together a number of organisations that exist actually within Otaki, but it would also provide a focal point for organisations that come and serve Otaki. We absolutely do need this. We are a growing town, and at the moment we have no focal point where we can hold um, events which can uh, cater for all ages and be an intergenerational facility. I would take a multi-year approach, and I am suggesting we start with a concept, we build a business model, we establish a government body and we begin to fundraise. And when I say we, I'm talking about the community, the council and EWI. I heard the buzzer, so I'll stop. Questions? Councillor Coots. Okay, Adrian, um, thanks for coming along. You and I have um, spoken about this one on and off for some time now. Yes. Um, would you um, be able to give us an indication of the level of, I guess, support or willingness amongst the community to um, be involved in a hub uh, concept, um, you know, are there others that are, I, I guess, open to that discussion to cohabit a building and pull resources together? Uh, yes, there are, um, but it's like anything. You have to build um, uh, a coalition of the willing in the first instance, um, and then when you get sufficient uh, kind of momentum behind such a thing, Others will, I am sure, follow. I think there will be inevitably uh, some robust discussions to be had with some groups, um, but there is certainly, uh, I, I think, uh, a willingness to, to undertake this kind of work. And I think the other thing that I would mention is um, it became very apparent to many of us, including many in the council, officers included, uh, under lockdown, that um, Otaki is actually very poorly served by various ranges of services. Now, to some extent that's true, to some extent it's not. And the extent to which it's not is that actually they're scattered around. It's piecemeal. It's not focused. And people in the community don't know where to go for those things. And so to have something uh, that I'm describing uh, as a hub would actually, I think, uh, generate greater and greater interest anyway. Councillor Bravanov. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Adrian, for coming along and speaking today. Um, some, of the, um, some of your submission talks to some very topical um, matters these days, and one of the ones I wanted to bring up was housing. Um, and 
uh, I don't know if you saw um, Sunday last night was talking about um, land first class, second class land being taken up by residential um, housing and um, I, I know that certainly Otaki has um, a real need for uh, for more housing, particularly low cost housing mm. and I suppose I'm just interested on your view about you know whether that some of that good land should be utilised for um, for housing or whether other alternatives should be looked at um. <laughs> I uh, wouldn't jump at the chance to say it should be used. What I would say is that probably one of the things that would be extremely useful would be to understand um, the, the, the distribution of spaces within Ortaki. There are a lot of kind of back blocks uh, um, in, in Ortaki that are not being, not being well used. Some of them are being developed off Wairanga Road, for example, but there are, there are plenty more uh, than that. So I think, I think one of the things that needs to be done in that particular community, I can't comment on other communities because I don't know them well enough, but in that particular community, spatial planning is, is absolutely critical. Uh, we shouldn't just say, should we use this or should we use that? It's not an either or, it's an and and once we know what kind of land we've got and where it is. Um, because that also then raises the whole issue of infrastructure in relation to that. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Good morning. Um, thank you for your submission. I, I do have a question. Um, do you have a, a proposed site in mind for the hub or some sort of a picture uh, in it that would elaborate a wee bit more on what's on, in your submission? Um, look, there are, there, are, there are probably various options for uh, a hub. Um, and they would range, and this is why I suggested a business model would, would be a, 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 an early starting point. Um, I, I wouldn't have any difficulty for, uh, in, in looking at some of the existing facilities in the town and the way that those might become a kind of hybrid facilities, I don't know. Um, uh, and I've had one or two conversations recently with, with officers in relation to that. Um, there are locations which could be used uh, from a kind of ground up development process but that would have um, probably greater funding implications than uh, using a hybrid approach yeah. so I think it's again it's, it, it's options um, but also those options aren't just a case of sticking a pin in a map they're actually looking at the way that that would work because I keep on using the term focal people have got to be able to find it and people yeah. have got to be comfortable coming to that place because if you have uh, a public event that's great because everybody will come but if on the other hand you're running a clinic, clinic of some kind that people don't necessarily want to be seen to be uh, attending you, you know you've got to be careful where you put these things okay. um, there are some options in terms of existing buildings uh, in the township um, but again, um, I, I think it's a question of looking at what is affordable uh, and what can be done with those sites. So there's a whole range of options. I haven't got anything fixed in my mind, but I have got a concept of what the hub itself would eventually look like. Okay, maybe um, you could um, sort of create a little opportunity out there for a community discussion and you could sort of yep. roll out those ideas further. And I'm guessing that then, in that case, your submission is more about a, a funding for a feasibility study or feasibility work? I, think, I right? think that would be very useful. Okay. Um, and I think uh, if it were in the long-term plan, it would create a real platform for that to happen and for that community discussion to mm. happen. This is not about me doing it on my own. Yeah, this that. is about me acting uh, in an advocacy sense, and as James has indicated I've been doing this now for three or four years I think mm. um, you know it, it, it's about activating it for the community with the community. Great and just one question one more question while I've got you captured here um, do you know is the mid, um, mid Central Health's new mental facility mental health facility open yet is it built is it underway? Uh, uh, the, the well there are two facilities um, 
There is the replacement to Ward 21, which will be the hospital level mental health care. That is at the late design stage and should be built and completed in 2022. However, um, they are looking, in addition to that, at sort of satellite facilities. Um, and there will be a facility, a five bed facility in Levin. Um, which will be part respite and part kind of halfway house, uh, and that will be open later this year. That's fantastic update. Thank you. Councillor Holiday. Uh, through you, Mr Chair. Um, thanks for coming in, Adrian. Just look, one question I had was just around, from a geographic perspective, uh, the community hub that you're talking about, where do you see that? Where's your preference to see that occur? Are you looking down the township or are you looking up sort of State Highway 1? area as such or does it really make no difference um uh, it might make a difference i don't know um uh, and and the reason why i don't know is because i don't know how the town's going to grow and where it's going to grow but in any case um uh, i i i think um my pref i guess my preference would be the township and my reasoning for that is quite simple, uh, and it's the kind of discussion that we've had at Elevate Otaki. Um, and it's, it's what I put in my uh, report on the Greater Otaki Vision. Actually, we shouldn't be looking at this bit of Otaki or that bit of Otaki. We should look, be looking at the way that we can join the whole thing up. So it, in a sense, it doesn't matter, and I'm agnostic about where it ends up, um, because it will serve the whole of... Otaki and Otaki Tohoro. Don't forget that. All right. Thank you very much for your submission and fronting up to speak on it. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. This is to um, nicely jigsaw into our lunch. Back one thirty or before one thirty anyway.